with a three-week reading of the entire 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And I would advise you all, since you know what's coming, to go home and read the whole 25th chapter. Read it over again several times during the week so you see how it fits together and what's coming. This is the beginning of it, and this is one of those passages, I said, that has to deal with the end times and judgment and doesn't seem at all familiar to us, especially if you know Matthew's Gospel, which talks about the kingdom of heaven is like this. This is talking about the kingdom of heaven in the future. And we begin at the beginning of that um, chapter. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were already went there went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open up to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Ooh. I added the ooh. <laughs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just this week, I celebrated one year in my home in Reisterstown which is a great thing. I've actually been here a whole year now. But it took me back to the time when I was packing to leave, and folks from Harmony United Methodist Church, the church I was serving before I came here, and Hedgesville United Methodist Church, the church I served before that, gathered in my home to help me pack. And as they were packing, we were putting things in different piles and in different boxes. One of the Harmony people said, Pastor Terry, may I ask you a question? I said, sure, and they said, why do you own 17 flashlights? And the Hedgesville people laughed because they knew the answer to that. It was because of this very passage. Because one of the times that I was preaching this, and this is the lectionary, and it comes up, you know, every three years in the, the cycle of lessons, and I've abandoned the lectionary for some time now because I've been through it 12 times, and there are too many parts of Scripture that are not included. But this time of year, I'm going back to the lectionary. And these are difficult passages, which is why it's so tempting not to preach them. But I was preaching this, and I shared a story about when I first moved to West Virginia. I was sitting there with my big golden retriever, Maggie, and suddenly we were watching television, and one of those emergency broadcast things came on and said, this is not a test. This is an actual emergency. There is a tornado headed for Hedgesville. Take cover now. Well, I didn't want to lose Toto on the other side, so I put my dog's leash on and I looked for a flashlight. And the only one that I had at that moment was one of those little ones that you squeeze, which ironically enough said, Jesus is the light of the world. I had gotten it at a carnival. But that's all I had between me and the darkness, and my power did go out. We did not get hit by the tornado, but it did go right past my home. And that's when I thought about this passage and being prepared, and I shared that in a sermon, and the next Sunday when I got to church, the pulpit was literally covered with gift boxes filled with flashlights. You'd think I would have learned my lesson there, but no, because there was another time when the lights went out and I went to get a flashlight, and you know what happened? The batteries were dead. Now, a flashlight without batteries is what? Useless paperweight. Maybe you could bludgeon someone with it if they got close enough to you and it was heavy enough. Not that I would bludgeon anyone that got close to me. But that reminded me, any Big Bang Theory fans here? The time that Sheldon's mother said, a cat can have kittens in an oven, but that don't make them biscuits. <laughs> a flashlight without batteries is pretty much a useless thing, isn't it? So what does that have to do with trimming your lamps? Do you know what to trim a lamp is? This goes back to the day of oil lamps. And in the time of scripture, the oil lamps they had were not made of glass unless, you know, there was glass then. There was glass um, in the Roman and Greek parts of the world and in Egypt. But these were little clay lamps that had a wick that came up. 
And to trim your lamp is to keep your wick at the proper length. And if you've ever had an oil lamp, you know that's hard to do. Now, I did think about giving you a demonstration today with the candle lighter that the Acolyte uses, because we do have one of those, even though our Acolyte this morning was Steve, and he had one of those little things to light your barbecue grill with instead. But I had an Acolyte. I was training Acolytes once, and I turned around during the training, and suddenly I felt this, this sizzling in the back of my, and he set my hair on fire <laughs> because he didn't trim his lamp. You know, you got to get those things at the right height. And that's the hardest part of training an acolyte because they want them to be flamethrowers. What happens if you have too much wick exposed, whether it's in an oil lamp or a candle lighter, is that it burns very quickly. And so to keep your lamp trimmed means to keep your wick at the proper height so that it doesn't go out, so that it doesn't waste oil. And oil at this time was a precious commodity. That's why most people, when the sun went down, they went down with the sun because they could not afford a candle or a lamp. And we have a story that, honestly, biblical scholars say makes no sense. This has nothing to do with the ancient practice of marriage in the first century in Judaism because the bridegroom is the one who's late. It's not their fault that he was delayed. And the weddings in those days were sort of like weddings now. They were mostly about the bride. So the story doesn't make sense on many levels. And it doesn't make sense to us that Jesus is telling this story to his disciples and saying that the bridegroom, which they knew then, those followers of his, those disciples who were listening, meant his presence with them. And they don't like hearing him say, when the bridegroom comes and you're not ready, tough, the door is shut and you are left outside. Nobody wants to think that about Jesus, do we? So we can either try to unpack every detail of the story, every nuance, or we could just take it for what it really is. It is about being ready. It is about watching for the coming of Christ into our lives now, into our lives in the future. And coming into our lives, the second coming of Christ, and we get that Thessalonians passage about meeting Jesus in the air, and people have from that extrapolated sort of a doctrine that they call the rapture, which is not exactly scriptural. It's sort of an amalgamation of a couple different passages together. But what does it really mean but that when Christ returns in the fullness of God's time, we will be with him? I've told the story before, and some of you have talked to me about how much it hurt you to hear what folks said to me when my husband died. My first trip back to church was for the church bazaar. And I shouldn't have gone. It was just a few weeks after he died, but I wanted to be supportive of the congregation. They did have me bake some things for them, even though... That was a tough thing to do that year. And a woman came up to me and said, I heard your husband just died. I expected her to say I was sorry, and instead she said, how terrible of you to want him back. How selfish could you be to want him back? I said, thank you, and I moved away from her, and she kept following me saying, that's a terrible thing for you to want. I almost turned around and quoted this passage to her. It doesn't say do not grieve. It says do not grieve as those who have no hope. You need to understand that 1 Thessalonians is the oldest book in the New Testament. It's the first one written. Paul went to Thessaloniki. It's a town that still exists, a city that still exists in modern-day Greece. And he was preaching to people who did not have a basis in Judaism. Judaism had theories about the resurrection of the dead, the bodily resurrection of the dead, not just Christ, but the bodily resurrection of the dead that we are promised in Christ when he returns. They had no concept in their past faith traditions of this. And even among Jews it was debated. The Sadducees thought that there was no resurrection, and they rejected the Pharisees because of that. The Pharisees believed that the resurrection meant that we would all be taken up in Christ. If you leave with nothing else, leave with that knowledge that when Christ returns, we shall be with him. We shall be with him. People have said to me before, I've never had a pastor who could tell me for sure what happens to me when I die. And I said, well, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. They said, will I be with Christ? Will I be with my loved ones? And I say to them, absolutely, according to Scripture. Those who die in the Lord will be raised in the Lord, and we will meet them again. I can't tell you if it's going to be on a cloud or an elevator or a grassy plain, but we will be together again. That is the word of God from Jesus Christ, our Savior. So we can look at this passage one of two ways from Matthew today. We can look at it as a bumper sticker someone gave me years ago that said, Jesus is coming, look busy. We can take it as a threat, or we can take it as a promise. I tend to take it as a promise. We tend at Christmas time to confuse Jesus and Santa all the time, don't we? You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why Jesus is coming. You better look busy. That's not what this is about. This is about proclaiming that Christ who was and is is yet to come. 
And don't we need a word like that in the world right now? I know that some of you were bitterly disappointed by the outcome of the election if you accepted it. And I know some of you were dancing in the streets at the outcome of the election. Why? Because we're all different and we, we come down on different positions in the political world. We don't agree on every matter of doctrine within the church. We can either let those things separate us, we can dig apart the nuances of those things, or we can claim our unity in Christ, which God in Jesus Christ has brought to us. In heaven, there will be no Jew nor Greek, no slave nor free, no female. That's from another passage that I love from Galatians. But in Christ, there will be no Republicans or Democrats or Libertarians or Independents or Communists or Socialists. In Jesus Christ, we have our unity. And so our prayers need to be for our country that we heal together and we learn to get along with each other, looking to the day of Christ's return not as a threat, but as a promise of God's abiding love for us, no matter what we have done to mess it up. So what does it mean to be ready for Christ? It doesn't mean to sit and worry. It doesn't mean to be like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who the one thing they had in common was to check off every part of the law that they had observed so that they could say, I am okay now. It's about the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And as we said last month, as we looked at stewardship as our response to God, it's about responding to the grace that we've been given. It's about responding to the bridegroom. It's about keeping ourselves prepared for his return, not out of fear, but out of response to the grace and the love that we have been shown. We do that with the image of light. I think that's why Matthew's gospel highlights this passage, this teaching of Jesus. Because if you look at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, what does it say in the, the time when Jesus calls his disciples up that mountainside to teach them and others follow because they're so enthralled, they want to hear every word he says. We call it the Sermon on the Mountain. And what does he say there? But you're a city on a hill. Nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel, but they put it on a stand so that it gives light to everyone in the house. Therefore, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's how we shine our light before others. We do what Christ has commanded us to do. That's why here we're going to collect pizza gift cards to send to college students who are feeling downtrodden right now because they can't be together in the way they used to be. That's why we tried to have a little party for kids last week so they could put on the costumes, even though it's not exactly a Christian celebration, but it's something they look forward to. And we give them a little bit of candy and give them a little bit of joy. But beyond that, that's why we're collecting these shoe boxes filled with things that go to different parts of the world to bring hope to children in need. I've said before one of the most amazing stories I heard about Operation Christmas Child, the shoebox project, was from someone who was packing the shoe boxes because they have to be, they're not taken apart. Some people think they're dismantled and rearranged. They only check them to make sure that there are no liquids or, or weaponry toys or things like that that are not allowed. But they opened a box and there was a neck brace, a cervical collar. And someone said, how would anybody think to give that to a child? What a ridiculous gift. What did they do, just go through their house and clean out their junk and put it in the box? And the woman was horrified until they received a letter back from a family in Central America saying, thank you and thank God for you because my father could not work because he could not afford a brace for his neck. You are the answer to prayer. That still gives me goosebumps every time I think about that story. That's why we're going to do some Thanksgiving dinners for folks. That's why a Christmas time will help those in need. That's why we're going to continue to reach out in mission because that's how you let your light shine before others. That's how you keep your lights trimmed and burning. Because just as you can have a cat that gives birth to kittens in an oven and that don't make them biscuits, sitting in a pew don't make us Christians, does it? It's the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ that calls forth a response of love and servanthood. And that goes to each other as well. We're living in times of tribalism, absolute tribalism, where if you don't agree with me, I'm done with you. That is not who we are in Jesus Christ. We let our light shine by working through our differences with those around us in love and in thankfulness and in grace. We sang one of my favorite hymns of all time this morning. We're going to sing the refrain at the end. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Not a threat, but a promise. 
heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood, watching and waiting, looking above. Fanny Crosby was blinded at an early age because her parents thought that she was having some vision problems and they took her to a quack doctor who poured chemicals in her eye and burned them to the point that she was never able to see again. But someone brought her these words or brought her this tune and played the tune for her and said, I'm looking for words to go with the tune. And the first thing she said was watching and waiting, looking above. Just as we talked when we celebrated the saints, we talked about our own Florence, not Florence, what am I saying? Um, Ann Rogers. Ann Rogers, who had lost so much of her sight, who said, when I die, the first thing I will see is the face of my Lord and Savior. That is what got Fanny Crosby, the writer of this great hymn, through. So we can go into this time of year reading these passages that do talk about judgment because we will be held accountable for the love that we have shown and the love that we have withheld to God by the love that we have shown and the love we have withheld from God's children. But it's not something to fear. It's something to encourage us to look to Christ, who is the bridegroom, who is the feast, and to understand that we're called to be ready. We're called to be ready when the time comes. And again, let me say what I say so many times, do not wait until you die to experience resurrection. Bodily resurrection, yes, that's a promise for the future when we leave this world and Christ comes again to claim us all. But the moment you realize the depth of God's love for you in Jesus Christ, your life begins anew and eternally. So be ready when he comes. Look to the day with joy in your hearts, with hope in your hearts, not with fear, not with trepidation, so that when he comes, whether it's in our lifetime or others, we are still allowed to grieve for those who have gone before us because we miss them desperately. But we don't grieve as people without hope because our hope is in Christ, who was, who is, who is to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>